past, she accused her cousins of sexual abuse. Now, she says her mother made her lie. Who's telling the truth? We tracked her mother down to find out. She says she's never had sex. She says today that she is still a virgin. Can you judge which is her true confession? From ABC News headquarters in New York, John Stossel and Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening and welcome to 2020. Who's telling the truth? That's the mystery in our first story tonight. It revolves around a very ugly divorce and the child caught between two battling parents. Did that child lie about sexual abuse? Her testimony helped put her two cousins in prison, but now she says she lied because her mother forced her to. Jim Avila looks for the truth. At 16 years old, Stephanie Arena says she has never had sex and is tired of talking about it. She doesn't want to relive her accusations of sexual assault that put her cousins John and Michael Arena in prison. She's trying to resume a normal life with family and friends, but she can't, not while she is haunted by the words that doomed those close to her. I am responsible for putting them in prison, and now that I'm older and I can understand the consequences of my actions, I need to stop up and do what I have to do to make things right. She's been trying to make things right for the past four years, writing letters of apology to both brothers in prison. This one to Michael. How are you? I just wanted to tell you I am sorry for putting you in jail. I hope you forgive me. Love, Stephanie. It all started for Stephanie when she was just seven and the center of a ruthless custody battle, becoming the victim in what some call a revenge plot orchestrated by her mother. Stephanie's starring role, she says, make believe she was molested. She was like, you have to go in court and say that, that your cousin sexually assaulted you. They put their penis in your vagina. It's 1997. Her parents are braced for a nasty fight over Stephanie and her brother. But there is a bright spot in the little girl's life. Her teenage cousins, John 15 and Michael Arena 14, Stephanie's close family. I'd want to hang out with them and spend time with them because they were my family and they were like big brothers to me. John and Michael felt the same way. Raised by loving parents, they were troubled to see Stephanie caught in a family war. She lived just down the road, and the brothers say they felt like her protectors. I've watched grow up for so long. I mean, just from being a little bitty thing and growing up. I, go, I can always see her smiling. But Stephanie's life of chaos is about to take a tragic turn. Her parents' feud erupts. Mom steals $600 from the cash register at work and then violates a custody order not to leave the state, stealing Stephanie and her brother, moving to this Florida homeless shelter, and then, to justify leaving Texas, tells social workers her kids were being molested. That's pretty much when she started all these lies about John and Michael. Lies, she says, that her cousins had repeatedly sexually molested her. At one point, Stephanie said the boys put their privates in my butt and forcing Stephanie to make a terrible choice, risk her mother's love by contradicting her story or turn on her cousins. She said, do you say these things about your cousins or what? Or she's going to jail. So I chose to tell these lies about Michael and John. Stephanie says she was a tool, prying her family apart, Manipulated, she says, because she was afraid to lose her mother. A woman Stephanie claims was on a mission of revenge against a father who would not drop the custody battle. It was just a basically my mom saying, well, I now hate your father's side of the family, so I'm going to twist it and manipulate it and hurt them as much as I possibly can. So Stephanie pointed her tiny finger at her beloved cousins and quietly mumbled the charges that would threaten them with prison. It it took me a long time for the story to get to flow straight. There's actually an interview where I was like, hold on, I have to ask my mom what to say. Strangely, Stephanie's mother never took her supposedly abused daughter to police or a doctor. Instead, she went to social workers and counselors who eventually went to police. John and Michael are high school teens at the time. Michael dreams of a football career. John's passion, fast cars and motorcycles. Neither brother has a police record when their parents voluntarily take them in for questioning. I went in there just 
doing what my father told me to do. You know, he just told me, don't worry, they're not going to do us any harm. And next thing I know, I'm being locked up. It is a weak case based mostly upon Stephanie's troubled accusation until John makes what he calls the mistake that changes his life. He confesses twice, first in his own writing. He says he is forced to say during a three-hour interrogation, 17 years old with no access to his parents or an attorney, that he had oral sex with Stephanie three or four times, claims police deny. As you're writing this down, you're thinking what? I just want to leave. You didn't think I if was... I write this down, I may never leave? Mm, not, not once. I was, I was scared. Not only did your confession hurt you, it hurt your brother. Right. What I was told from my lawyer was that if I took the plea bargain for five years, they would drop the charges on my brother. And what happened to your brother? He got 20. John's attorney denies offering him that deal. In the end, John was sentenced to seven years and was paroled after five. As for his 16-year-old brother, who never confessed, in just three short days, he's tried, found guilty, and sentenced. Now 22, he's serving 20 years. At Dolph Briscoe Prison in Dilly, Texas, I asked Michael about his brother's confession. He, he wanted to protect me. And when he confessed, were you angry at him? I was, I was angry at him. I mean, I was, I was shocked at first. It broke my heart, you know, my own brother doing that, trying to, trying to be a big hero when there was no need to be. John's plan had backfired. His confession that he thought would help his brother, in fact, may have sealed both their fates, helping convince the prosecutor to pursue charges. I wish I could change places. You'd rather be where your brother is and him out? Yeah. Because he didn't do nothing wrong. He didn't sign the confession. I did. I made the mistake of signing a confession. And Michael goes to trial. Swift justice, just three days in court. He can't pay for experts, so there's just a day and a half of testimony. The main witness is Stephanie, and she can barely get the charges out. She can't remember when it happened. Where it happened is vague. She says her house, her cousin's house, and her grandparents' house. And when asked specifics about oral sex, she first says, I think so, I can't remember. I didn't even know what I was saying. And I didn't, I didn't even comprehend the consequences of what I was saying about my cousins. The evidence used to back Stephanie's charge had its problems too. On the stand, Stephanie never provided details about how she was molested. But a medical expert for the prosecution, Dr. Pamela Sue Green, who never personally examined Stephanie, but reviewed medical records, testified that her scant or thin hymenal tissue is a suspicious finding for possible vaginal penetration. A thin rim of hymenal tissue is not diagnostic of penetration, not. Dr. Stephen Isle has 20 years experience performing thousands of exams on kids with claims of molestation. We showed Dr. Isle and three other leading doctors Stephanie's complete exam. They all disagree with the prosecution's medical expert because they say she overstated the evidence. If this material and this history and this physical were used to put people in jail, that that was over the top, that that shouldn't have been done, and that's, that's terrible. In a letter to 2020, the prosecution's medical expert stands by her conclusion that penetration was a possibility. Based on, she states, my review of the entire medical report. I know that I didn't have sex, so what that lady was saying on the stand, I don't know. I am still a virgin, and I'm telling the truth. Sister down to find out. I did not frame truth. those boys. Who's telling the truth? Next. Continues with Jim Avila. Young Stephanie Arena was once hailed as a brave little witness when at seven years old she went to court and said her cousins molested her. But now that she has apologized to those boys and in perhaps her most courageous moment publicly recanted those charges, she says the same judge and prosecutor who thought her so brave treated her like a criminal. I was like, wait a second. You're a judge, you're supposed to serve justice, and now I'm telling you the truth and you don't care. In fact, Judge Edward Johnson warned her repeatedly that she could face felony prosecution for perjury and a possible 10-year prison sentence if she recanted her original charges. Stephanie says she thought that was a threat from a judge who didn't want to spend any more time on this case. 
But even at her young age, she refused to back down, willing to go to prison. I really do think that two to 10 years is a small price to pay. And now a cruel irony. Stephanie's mother, who was supposed to be protecting her daughter, accusing the cousins of molesting Stephanie, is at the same time keeping company with two convicted child molesters, even living with this one. A judge found the mother's judgment so poor, he took Stephanie away from her and granted sole custody to her dad. That's just one of the reasons we wanted to talk to Stephanie's mom, Lavana Arena. It wasn't easy finding her, but we did, living with a boyfriend in Muscatine, Iowa. I did not frame truck. those boys, and my children asked me to take them out of there. And in fact, if, um, they begged me. And to this day, you think those boys molested your daughter? Yes, I do. But the medical records show that Stephanie has never had any problems, never had sex even. Sir, I've been told a long time ago that it's possible that there are uh, tissues, whatever, Medically, um, after a long period of time, it might be difficult to um, detect. How about anal penetration? There's no evidence of that either. Sir, There's you no, got I mean, the, the report. I, can I show you the report? You got me totally stumped. Let me show you the report. You can read this here. Did not see any sign of injury or scarring. There's no, there's no evidence here that she's either been raped or even had sex. And she says she's never had sex. She says today that she is still a virgin. Here's another troubling Levana pattern. Police records and family testimony suggest that on three different occasions, she has falsely accused family members of abusing her kids, including a charge against Stephanie's father, Stephen. She accused me and John and Michael again while they were incarcerated. So, um, so they're in jail. Right. And, and, and she says they're still molesting your daughter. Right. So what did that tell you? That she uses this as a weapon to get what she wants. Lavana Arena asked us not to use this sidewalk interview, suggesting a more formal interview later. She apparently decided against that and stopped taking our calls. But her live-in boyfriend dropped a bombshell, explaining to me by phone that Lavana would like to tell the truth, wants to explain why she made Stephanie lie. But her boyfriend told me, quote, Lavana is afraid she would go to jail. When I realized that she manipulated me, that's when I was like, I don't really care for you anymore. Don't really care for you anymore? As in hate you, I don't want anything to do with you. That's strong. You hate her. I can honestly say I hate her. So that gets us back to John, who after all these years is still trying to explain what he insists was his false confession. And maybe he finally has an answer. As a condition of parole, he has to submit to a yearly polygraph test, which he recently did, administered by Peter Heller, who works not for John, but for the state of Texas. And John passed when he denied molesting Stephanie. Quote, no deception indicated. The examiner was so convinced, he agreed to a rare interview with 2020. In my opinion, he was truthful to, to the uh, relevant questions. If I was to testify in court, my opinion would be that he did not molest Stephanie. So what happens now? As the county attorney Rick Miller contends in a letter to 2020, all of these matters were thoroughly vetted on appeal after appeal, and the evidence remained what it was, convincing. Wrongful conviction expert and private eye, Paul Cialino, has written about helping release dozens of death row inmates. He says there is just one route for the arena boys. It's bleak. Without a crew of high-priced lawyers, the governor is going to have to step in here and do the right thing. These are two kids who didn't have resources, and, and no one's helping them. And of course, they're not the only victims. Young Stephanie Arena is a victim too. Not of molestation, she says, but of guilt. Takes me about an hour, hour and a half each night to fall asleep, and that's when I think about it a lot. It's right before I go to sleep. There is not a day Stephanie doesn't think about the devious plot she says her mother masterminded, Revenge, starring a seven-year-old girl. What is the least you want out of this? Just for somebody to care. Just for, for somebody to realize, hey, what happened to these boys was wrong. 